the words of the conference around. Let's do nano, quantum, and soft using computers. And this is essentially going to be something of the order of which I, I'm going to talk today. So there'll be three themes that you'll see as we go through the talk. One is tools and measurement, and how we have a research program that necessarily involves developing new tools to study the phenomena that we seek to understand. The first half of the talk is going to be about nanotechnology and exploring uh, phenomena and devices at the atomic scale and phenomena at that scale. The second half of the talk is biomedical sciences and biophysics and both how we're trying to understand specific problems but how we're also trying to approach a medium scale project within the large scale enterprise of trying to understand the whole human body. I'll give you a sense of that. Computational challenges and what that might represent and what you'll see as I go through the talk. The first one might be considered a small challenge. To somebody who does atomistic simulations, there's no small challenge in doing atomistic simulations. And in fact, uh, they're often called grand challenges. But the idea of looking at a dynamical system that has tens of thousands, millions of atoms is a problem that is in some ways well specified at this time. You're trying to solve Schrodinger's equation or modified versions of Newton's equation for a certain number of atoms. The equations are well understood. The numbers of atoms and the formulation of the problem is understood. The challenge then is the raw computing power you have available to move through the problem. The second half of my talk is going to be about understanding the lung. And that's what I'm going to call a medium scale problem. We call it the virtual lung project. And what we're trying to do there is to integrate various aspects of basic science knowledge about how the lung works and integrate that into a single computational framework that in the end really challenges what we mean by understanding something as complex as how an organ works. The really big challenge is going to be the in silico human. How do in the end, someday, we actually calculate what it means to be healthy, to have a disease, and to have a cure? And how do we put that into a computational framework that we can run as a simulation. So this in the end, for a vision talk, might be the talk I give in two years. <laughs> but today, let me get started with aspects of the problem. One thing I've been delighted to see in India is I haven't seen one Starbucks coffee shop. And what Starbucks does for us in the United States is they redefine a small cup of coffee as being grand, grande. So in that sense, atomistic simulations now is called a grand challenge in the United States. And, the funding, and what the funding agencies mean by that is really it's a five-year challenge. In that sense, the Virtual Lung Project is an enormous challenge. It perhaps is a 20-year challenge. There's a new word that my daughters tell me. And of course, it's new to me because I'm a parent, so I'm four years behind the times. To them, this is the way they talked five years ago. And it's ginormous, a combination of gigantic and enormous. And perhaps this is what the in silico human is. Perhaps that's a 50-year challenge. But hopefully, as we go through this talk, as we understand in our uh, vision discussion, we can understand or, or start framing the questions of what quantum computing and some of the algorithms we've been talking about today, how they might help understanding a problem that's uh, framed, in, I think, in very different ways from some of the challenges that have been described. So I was delighted to hear one of the first talks uh, start with the caveat that no matter what the title of the course is, the professor teaches. So with that, let me get started with, no matter what I called this or what the first few slides are, this is what I know. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. 
This is our research group, and it spans uh, nanotechnology. We have the ability to fabricate devices at the nanometer scale. We have uh, fabrication technologies available to us, and you'll see some of that in the, the first half of the talk. And that's um, this nanoscale sciences here. Uh, we have a, an NIH-sponsored center for applying technologies to a wide range of uh, biophysics and biomedical problems. And then we also develop tools in collaboration with our computer science colleagues. And it's really uh, the placement of all these into a single group that I think gives us interesting perspectives and the ability to approach problems in, in new ways. So this is one of the systems we've developed. It's called the Nano Manipulator System here. Here's some of my colleagues have helped develop this, Mike, Russ, and Sean. This is an atomic force microscope tip. If you're not familiar with the technique, there's very little to understand in a sense. It's a sharp silicon tip that's brought in contact with a sample. In this case, it's an individual carbon nanotube. It's <clears throat> the tip and the sample are inside a scanning electron microscope. So it's two microscopes. The electron microscope allows you to see globally what's happening, while the AFM tip allows you to reach in and touch. The control of the microscope is achieved through a handheld pen. And this is the fun. As you move your hand, the tip moves inside the microscope, like this. The fun part is, as the AFM tip touches the sample, whether it's a carbon nanotube or a single strand of DNA, it goes up in the air over the object, or it feels the force. And the fun part is that that's conveyed to your hand. So as you move your hand back and forth, the tip might go up on top of a strand of DNA. Your hand is pushed to go up in the air. And in that sense, you feel what's happening at the nanometer scale. And it gives you ways of exploring what's happening at that scale. So the darling of our investigation is going to be the carbon nanotube. Now, this took nanotechnology by a storm in around 1991. And for our purposes, it's very exciting because of the atomic lattice, the very regular lattice that's formed on the surface of the carbon nanotube. And this atomic lattice is mirrored in graphite, which has sheets of this atomic lattice. And in our interest in looking at atomic scale effects, this turns out to be a wonderful playground for observing the interaction between atoms on one, on, in one part of a device with atoms in another part of the device. The other fascinating thing about this is typically when you do atomic scale studies in condensed matter physics, you have to do this in ultra high vacuum so that there's no impurities on your sample. Well, it turns out due to the, the, the nature and the non-reactivity of carbon in these forms, we could actually perform these experiments in air or the vacuum of an electron microscope and see atomic scale phenomena. The other thing to understand about the carbon nanotube is the way that the lattice wraps around the nanotube gives you something like a screw axis or the chirality of the nanotube. And that can change, for example, how this nanotube would sit on the graphite lattice underneath it. And it defines an angle that that nanotube would sit on the lattice. And that's going to be important for us to understand. There's two types of nanotubes I'm going to talk about. One is going to be at the, the latter part of this section, is going to be single walled nanotubes. So it's an individual layer of graphite. And you can see our cross-sectional picture here of these single wall nanotubes. The version I'm going to talk about initially are called multi-wall nanotubes, and these have concentric cylinders, and these are um, much thicker, 3 to 100 nanometers, than the single wall counterparts. The first experiment I'm going to talk about is actually discovering this atomic scale phenomena and the dynamics of the system. And the way to understand this is actually quite simple, to understand the experiment and the logic of the experiment. We cannot resolve in our microscopy right now the individual atoms on the substrate and the nanotube. 
But it turns out to deduce what's happening at the atomic scale, we don't need to do that. We can look at the overall motion of the objects. So here's two pencils. This pencil has a diagonal cross section. It has facets to it, faces to it. This one here is round. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to push on each of these pencils. What happens? Well, for the pencil that has square faces, when you push on it, it doesn't roll. It slides. And when it slides, it rotates in the plane. For the pencil that's round, when you push on it, it moves, but it maintains its same angle on the surface. That's a hint to how you can understand what's happening when we push on the nanotube with the atomic force microscope tip. The other thing you'll notice, and I've done this with a bit of foreshadowing, is this pencil does not have a regular tip. And so the, uh, the tip changes. In other words, the, the face that you observe in the microscope changes because the, the, the uh, pencil has rolled. So here's our experiment. We have the nanotube, the carbon nanotube, on a substrate. And we're going to take the AFM tip and push on the nanotube and see how it moves. Now this substrate here can be graphite or it can be silicon. We've done this on many different surfaces. <clears throat> and what we find is that when we do this on any other surface other than graphite, we always see this phenomena. The tube rotates. By the way, you can see this lattice here. This is put on there by the computer scientists in the image. It would be wonderful if we could do that experimentally, but the computer scientists do this to help us understand the rotation of this nanotube. But when we also put the nanotube on graphite, sometimes we see this phenomenon. It rotates in the plane. And it turns out that if you look at the robotics literature, you can very easily understand quantitatively how this rotation happens based on where you push on the AFM tip. It's purely macroscopic physics. And the National Science Foundation doesn't pay us to do macroscopic physics on nanotubes. So let's go on and look at the atomic scale phenomena. When we push on this nanotube on graphite, sometimes, and it only happens on graphite, we see this. The nanotube translates across the surface, and this is a series of snapshots, and it does not change its angle. Furthermore, as we push it across, the image changes, the tip changes of, our, of the nanotube. And you can see that the image reproduces itself roughly. This one here is something like this, this one here, something like this, this one here, something like this. In other words, the picture repeats itself as we keep pushing this across. This down here is data of the force that we're applying as we translate the nanotube across the surface. And you can see that the force we apply has spikes in it. It's like almost, we apply a lot of effort and then suddenly the nanotube moves and the force goes down. Apply effort, the nanotube moves. And what we're doing is we're seeing the jumps as the nanotube rolls across the surface. This pattern repeats itself. Again, consistent with the idea of rolling. So the fact that there's no in-plane rotation, the image changes, and the lateral force is periodic all tells us that we're seeing rolling of this object on the surface. Now this does not necessarily mean yet that we're seeing atomic lattices interacting with each other. Well, this is the first hint that this is what we're seeing. When we sit there and just do imaging, of the atomic force microscope of the nanotube on the surface, what you find is that stable images only occur when the nanotube is lined up along these directions. So this image here is a composite, an overlay of three different images, separate images taken. But these are stable images, and you can see that they line up 60 degrees apart from each other. This, this is also consistent with when we push a nanotube, the force can be low during the time the nanotube is sliding, but then suddenly it locks in and it starts rolling. And then the force curiously goes up for the rolling. And that, when we image the tube when it's rolling, it's in one of these positions. And this tells us, or this is consistent with 
the registry of graphite lattices on top of each other. When these lattices overlap with each other, they're 60 degrees apart. So this was the first hint that the graphite lattice mattered. This was the real clincher, though, in that there are two tubes here on a pristine graphite surface, but you can see the two tubes have different angles. They're locked in at different angles on the surface. And that's because of the way the lattice wraps around the nanotube. And the fact that there's a screw axis, or there's a chirality to the nanotube. <clears throat> but even within these different orientations, these tubes can be rolled back and forth across the surface without rotating in the plane. They roll. And in fact, if you start off with one nanotube here, the other nanotube here, and you take the tip, and you push on this one, it'll roll, hit this one, and then both of them will roll across the surface with one nanotube making the other nanotube roll. And that's evident here in the force. Here's the force of making one nanotube roll. Here's where it hits the second nanotube, and both of them roll together. So this finally told us that we were seeing atomic lattices interlocking at a surface to produce rolling. And when the lattices don't interlock, we see sliding. Now, Don Brenner at North Carolina State University simulated this with atomistic simulations. And so here's a single wall nanotube, which is not in registry. And he gives it a push, and you can see the tube slides as it moves across the surface. Now, when he puts them in registry, what he observes is that initially the single wall nanotube slides, but then it starts going through a rolling, sliding phase. So this phenomenon can also be captured in the atomistic simulations at the single wall nanotube level. And it also reveals an interesting interplay between sliding and rolling during this phenomenon and how it plays out in the energy of the system. And if you look in detail at this, you can almost imagine atomic scale treads or atomic scale gears where the teeth in the gear are individual atoms. The next step for us in our interest in this kind of device is to ask, does this atomic scale interaction reveal itself in the electrical properties of the device? And so for that, we do a simple measurement. Here's the nanotube on the surface. Here's the graphite. We take our AFM tip, and now we attach a wire to it. And that wire is going to carry current into the nanotube, and we collect the current in the substrate. So we're looking at this interface here between the nanotube and the surface. And we, what we ask is, if we change the interaction between the nanotube and the surface, does that reveal itself in the electrical properties of that contact? So you can imagine the experiment is simply to put the nanotube on the surface, measure the current through it, then take the tip, push the nanotube to rotate it, and then measure the current going through it again. And then we're going to measure this current as we rotate the nanotube. And when we do that experiment, we find that the, the resistance here, as a function of the angle, goes up and down periodically. It changes by a factor of 50 as we rotate the nanotube. We know these points here are where the lattices interlock because we measure the friction. We measure the point where the rolling happens. And so that allows us to pin exactly what we mean by zero degrees here. That's when the lattices interlock according to rolling. And if you blow up the scale here, right here, you can see this phenomena here where the resistance is high when the lattices are out of registry, but when they're in registry like this, the resistance is low. So this is uh, one of the advantages of working with undergraduates, especially in computer science, is they don't realize how underpaid they are. And so you'll see several movies and images here generated by our undergraduate computer science students, <coughs> which are beautiful images. And it's only when they graduate three years later that they realize how much they could have charged us for generating such images. And what this shows here, this shows us it's an artist's conception. There's no calculation behind this particular image. It shows us the electron wave on the graphite 
on the uh, carbon nanotube, and it shows us the electron wave in the substrate. Now, the thing that is true in this picture is that the conduction states of the electron on the nanotube are preferentially along particular directions related to the graphite lattice. Similarly, in the substrate, these directions are directions in momentum space or in K space where transport is possible. And so, actually, if you go through the quantum mechanics of this problem, what we're seeing here is essentially momentum conservation in this contact here. Typically, when people talk about contacts, you talk about energy conservation, for example, in band overlaps and semiconductor contacts. Here, we're talking about momentum conservation in a contact. The next question for us was, can we look at this atomic scale interaction that we see in mechanical effects and in electrical effects and capture this in a device setting? So if we look at some calculations, these were performed by my colleagues Alper Buldum and J.P. Liu at UNC. They took single wall nanotubes here. They brought them into contact and again they measured the transport properties from one nanotube to the other. And there's two ways that you could start changing this interaction. You could rotate it, you twist this nanotube with respect to this one, or you can translate, you can move this nanotube rigidly with respect to this one. In either case, you see changes in the resistance of the contact according to either the rotation or the translation. And again, these, these changes here correspond to atomic lattice interlocking effects, similar to what we see in the rolling and the electrical contact. So the challenge for us was to say, can we put these effects into a device? And that has started basically what's going on about four years now of research, and we're getting close. That's okay, it wasn't that important. So here's the device. To capture this in a device, we take a single nanotube, we put a paddle on it, just a metal seesaw, and by twisting this, we can twist this nanotube here. The goal eventually will be to put another nanotube across it. Here would be the contact that we study, and as we rotate this nanotube here, we'd be changing the atomic interaction between these two nanotubes here, and hopefully capture that in our measurement. Unfortunately, I don't have results on this device. So what I'm going to talk about for the next slides is our progress in moving towards this. I'm just going to talk about this device here with the paddle on it and what we understand about that. Let's see now if Windows will be cooperative with my talk. So there are more mundane computational challenges that we need to solve while we talk about grandiose schemes of quantum computing. We haven't solved silicon. All we had to do was threaten it in order to get it to work. So here's what we're doing here. Here's a, uh, a paddle device. This is a silicon paddle device. And various groups at Cornell and Caltech have done fantastic things with these devices in both in terms of understanding the quantum properties and the, the uh, Q and the sensing properties of these devices. Here's our devices where we have a, uh, an individual nanotube. It's suspended up off the substrate. We etch away the substrate. And then we deposit a piece of metal here to give us a way of twisting the nanotube and also a way of detecting the torsion in this device. So how are we going to measure uh, the properties of the nanotube? <clears throat> In America, we call this a seesaw. Do we have seesaws in India? Do you call them seesaws? Something like that. So for a physicist, what we have to do is apply a torque. And applying a torque, we have to apply a force. But we also have to know the distance over which that force is applied in order to get the torque to twist the paddle. So. <clears throat> so what we're going to do instead of um, instead of doing, measuring this distance here explicitly, which is difficult to do, we do a series of measurements of pressing down on the paddle with the AFM tip. And in doing so, oh, okay. So um, our challenge then is to measure uh, 
the torque that we apply to the device. And um, so, uh, so we do that by bringing the AFM tip down on the paddle. And, uh, and then the, the uh, tip moves along the paddle and presses down on it to twist the paddle. And in doing so, we can acquire a set of data of the force that the, two, the tip applies as it moves along the, two, uh, the uh, paddle. And in that way, we can understand exactly where the carbon tube is in the paddle. Um, and we can understand the, uh, the twisting of the paddle as well, the, the uh, torsional properties of the carbon nanotube. So this is um, the smallest paddle that we have to date. Uh, it's about 300 nanometers in length. This is a multi-wall uh, carbon nanotube device, which probably is about 15 nanometers in diameter. Um, the student, Arish Patel, was an undergraduate in our group. He has since left. And uh, uh, sometimes the most fun things the students do is when they don't ask you for permission before they go ahead and did them. So he came up to us one day, very proud, with this device. And what the device is, it's uh, two paddles on a single nanotube. And we were both, we were delighted with it. It's a wonderful device. <clears throat> but then we looked at him and we said, Arish, what's it good for? And he just looked at us. It was like, hmm. -hmm. And uh, the device sat there, and you can think about various interesting things like coupled oscillators and exotic things, but sometimes the simplest insight is the most powerful. And in the end, what we realized was this device can tell us that we are truly twisting the carbon nanotube itself when we press on the paddle. And the way we could do that is we image both paddles. We can quantify their tilt angles. If we then take the AFM tip and we press on one of them to rotate it, the question is, does the other paddle rotate? If the nanotube itself is truly twisting, this other paddle should also rotate. And in fact, that's what we observed. And so that simple observation was, in a sense, the most profound thing uh, to do with this device. So moving on, we have since uh, also created, over the last uh, two years, individual single wall nanotube torsional oscillators or torsional devices where this nanotube here is one nanometer in diameter. The, uh, the measurement becomes very difficult though because uh, the, the torsional stiffness of a rod from continuum mechanics goes as the fourth power of the radius of the rod. So when you go from a 10 nanometer rod to a one nanometer rod, it suddenly is 10,000 times less stiff. So that presents real challenges for this technique here of using the AFM tip, the AFM tip to press on this. And in fact, what we find is we start ripping our torsional oscillators up when we touch them with the AFM tip. So we have to go to, in the end, what we want to do anyway, and that is a completely integrated measurement using um, a potential, an electric potential applied to the device to actually twist the paddle. So here is applying a voltage to the back gate here, 0, 3, 6, 10 volts, and you can see the image change as we're twisting the paddle in this device. And we can actually get this multi-wall, this is a particular is a multi-wall nanotube device, we can get this to oscillate. And we can observe the, uh, the resonance frequency. Um, one of the goals with devices is to get high Q, which means low energy loss, which means high sensitivity. There's a problem, though, in the electromechanical field. What I'm plotting here is Q versus the size of the device. And this isn't talked about very often in the nano device area. But this is a set of uh, devices over the years from 78 to 2000 and how the Q has gotten worse as the device gets smaller. And that's because of the nature of the energy loss in these systems doesn't scale favorably with the change in the resonance frequency as you go down. And so here we are with our device. So we're right on this pathway. <laughs> and so the next uh, thing for us to solve is really the energy loss mechanisms in nano devices. And I think atomistic uh, Simulations are going to be very important for understanding the role of defects in these systems 
So we can start moving this cue up while retaining the small device. Um, in terms of measurements now, where we're, the direction we're moving into, these, this is, a, again, a single indiv an individual single wall nanotube device. This is a paddle. These are electric probes here to apply potentials to this device to rotate it. Here we blow up the device. You can see the individual nanotube here. And when we apply the potentials to this device, again, you could see the paddle rotate. We do uh, simulations of the electric fields and the torque on the device in order to calibrate the torques that we're applying. This is just a blow up in the twisting of this. And we, through our calculations here, we can measure the, uh, the twisting or the torque on the device to measure the, um, the torsional properties, the mechanical properties of an individual single wall uh, carbon nanotube. The thing that we're doing right now is actually measuring the transport properties through this nanotube. And in measuring the, we can measure the electrical properties through the nanotube as we twist the paddle. And in that way, really complete the um, integration of the device in that we're not measuring the twisting by an image in an electron microscope, but we're measuring the twisting by the current through the nanotube. And it also gives us insights fundamentally into the properties of the nanotube in terms of the electromechanical coupling. Now we're going to start the second half of the talk in talking about the lung and the biophysics of the lung. So here's the... Uh, the lung, and the role of the lung is to bring oxygen into the body. And what, we, what the body does then is it creates this large surface area between the oxygen coming in and the bloodstream. Anybody have any idea what that surface area is of the lung? If you took that surface area and you stretched it out flat, it'd be about twice the floor surface area of this room. Fold it up inside your body. It's amazing. That's an engineering solution. The unintended consequence of that is if a pathogen, a virus or bacteria, wants to get into your body, the perfect place to do that is in your lung. And that's the challenge the lung faces. So your lung has to clear out those pathogens. How many people here have changed the air filter in your house? It's usually a task which I try to avoid because it's horrible, right? You open up that filter, you pull that filter out, and it's covered with dust. Animal hair, there's also bacteria and viruses lodged in there that you can't see. What's captured in that filter is what's being captured in your lung every day. Remarkably, your lung is sterile. So how does it do it? First of all, it has a filter. The filter is mucus. Everybody here knows what mucus is. You've cleaned a version of it from your child's nose when they have a cold. And that mucus layer lines the lung. It's about, you should think of it about the, um, the size of a sheet of paper. The thickness of a sheet of paper lining all the surfaces of your lung, the uh, surface area of twice this room. Your body, though, then has to change that filter. And it does that with these fine projections called cilia, which constantly sweep this mucus layer up from your lung to your throat, where you can then swallow everything out through your gut. And that, in the end, is the physics challenge that we're undertaking in understanding. This here is a, is a side image. This is the tissue up here. This is the air layer. These fine projections here are cilia. And if the movie was playing, you'd see these cilia beating rhythmically in time. What are cilia? <clears throat> of course, we're very proud of our single wall nanotube device. The complexity of that device is absolutely trivial compared to what cilia do in a biological system. Just talking about the individual cilia. This is the mechanical structure of a cilia. And we know this structure from looking at transmission electron microscope images of what this, in the end, is a nanomachine is doing. If you look at this image, you can see these 
structures here which extend all the way throughout the length of the cilium. They're about 7 microns long, about 250 nanometers in diameter. These are kind of the passive structural elements, the steel columns in the building. That's the cilia. These are microtubules that themselves are made of proteins. So these individual dots here are not atoms. These are proteins, which themselves are made of tens of thousands of atoms. So these structural elements go up and down. What makes the object move, the cilia move, are these motors, these proteins, which change their conformation in burning ATP, and they cause these structural elements to slide past each other. When they slide past each other, but they keep the base fixed, it causes twists, it causes bends to occur in the cilia. And that's what causes the cilia inevitably to bend. Now there's a saying that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so of course in any discipline that you happen to be in, you kind of frame the world around you. So it was fun to understand that over the past five years, cilia have had a huge surge of intellectual activity in the biological community in understanding the role of cilia in the human body. They're, they're literally everywhere in the human body. Um, here's David here. Uh, David has cilia in his brain where they cause the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. And in fact, defects in cilia um, are uh, associated with hydrocephaly, which is a, um, uh, a disorder that affects uh, infants. They're in your ear serving the same function as you, they have in your nose and in your lungs where they're sweeping um, pathogens out of your body. I already talked about the lung. They're in the kidney, in a form in the kidney where they sense flow. The cilia, the tufts of cilia in the lung. Uh, you're familiar with images of how sperm move. Sperm have this tail. This is called often a flagella. <clears throat> It is identical in structure to the cilia in the lung. It has the same architecture, the same proteins even. <clears throat> so you can imagine, and it's true, that if there's a defect in the proteins that affects cilia in the lung, it also affects how flagella beat. So there's a class of patients which cough a lot because their cilia cannot move the mucus through the lung. The only way they can get the mucus out is by coughing. But they're also infertile. They can't produce children. And it's because the sperm cannot move. They're also in the fallopian tubes. In the fallopian tubes, the cilia are responsible for moving the ovum from the ovaries to the uterus. So again, if the cilia aren't working, the, uh, the ovum can't move correctly. A doctor named Kartenager understood, let me skip this here. A doctor named Kartenager understood <clears throat> that there was a third condition he saw in patients, and that was that half of the patients that had these problems of coughing and being infertile also had their heart on the wrong side of their body. That's a condition called situs invertus. And that indicated that cilia are also important in embryonic development. And in fact, over the last three years, three to five years, this is a 2002 paper, they've identified that there are individual cilia inside a region of the developing uh, embryo called the nodal cleft. So you blow that up, you can see this field of cells, you can make out the cells, and there's a single cilium projecting up there. These cilia beat. They actually don't, they don't beat like this, like the lung cilia do, they beat like this. And they produce a fluid flow. <clears throat> And so if you look at this region here, they beat and produce a fluid flow. That fluid flow can be detected by putting tracers in. And what this group did in Japan was they took these mouse embryos and they put them in a fluid channel. And what they showed was they can control which side of the mouse, developing mouse, the heart shows up on by changing the direction of the fluid flow across these oriented embryos. So that shows that cilia are important for embryonic development. They control fluid flow in the developing uh, embryo, and that dictates the distribution of organs inside the body. Now, I'm going to return to the lung. Here's the filter. It's this thin layer of mucus. Here are the cilia, which make the mucus flow. 
What this movie would show is uh, our experimental system, which is actually a culture in a dish of these lung cells. They divide, they sprout cilia, and then inside a little dish here, the cilia all beat. They produce a layer of mucus. They regulate the height of that mucus. This is an amazing system, if you think about what your body is doing. And they produce fluid flow in this little dish, a coordinated fluid flow. So you can imagine, or it was fascinating for me to see the delight of my students who have been working with these carbon nanotube devices. And no matter what happens, what you're doing, if you do it for five years, it's somehow no longer as fascinating or as remarkable as it was when you first did it. For them to come over and see these cilia beating in this dish all by themselves, no voltage inputs, producing a fluid flow, was uh, an amazing thing to, to see. <clears throat> so here's lung research. Here's the lung. We have a group of about 15 investigators studying the lung. They're, they've been doing it themselves over in health sciences. They're all looking at different aspects of the lung. <clears throat> some of them are looking at the polymer physics, some looking at the mucus, some looking at what happens in animals. Tim Elson is a ma mathematician who's doing the biochemical network modeling for the chemistry that's happening. Soren Mitchin, I'll talk about him soon, is doing finite element models of cilia beating. And me, well, I'm a physicist, so I think about forces. But all of us thinking about the lung with a different viewpoint, Rick Boucher thinks about patients, which is very important. How do we come back to an integrated understanding of the lung? And so in a sense, this is like the parable about the blind men and the elephant. Each one of them touches the elephant at a different place and comes up with a different mental picture of what the elephant is. But of course, the elephant isn't what each one sees individually. It's what together they're seeing. And so it's actually a very profound comment, I think, about research in general, and in particular research in medicine, where the problems are so complex. The knowledge, it's almost frightening to understand that the integrated understanding occurs in individual people. It comes together in groups, in meetings, but in the end, it goes away as individual people. As people interested in, in computation, I'm sure you'd appreciate a perspective which says that you really don't understand anything until you have it written down as a formal equation or you have it codified in a computational code to run a simulation. It is then that you can really convince yourself that your logic is correct. Until then, you're doing these manipulations in your brain which may or may not be true. So it's, it's frightening, in a sense, to have a perspective where you realize how little we integrate knowledge these days. So here's our goal overall with this project, and that is to codify all the understanding that all these individual people have into an integrated simulation that, will, uh, that we will be able to run individually or separately. Um, I'm sorry, that we will be able to run as a single computation and capture what's happening in the lung. Now, as engineers, you appreciate this diagram here. Usually the faces in the audience, when I'm describing this to a biomedical audience, uh, they grow uh, frightened when I put up this image here of a feedback loop. But all of you are very happy with this. This is the temperature control in a house, where you have a furnace, which you might call an effector. You have the house with inputs, heat loss, results in the room temperature, Room temperature is sensed by a thermometer. There's control circuitry, which then controls the furnace, the complete feedback loop. Biological systems, we have to think about them as feedback loops. That's what they are. Our challenge, though, is how do we put this abstract understanding onto actually a very challenging problem to understand, like a biological system. And in a sense, this is part of the issue of asking the right question is really the challenge. Achieving the answer, of course, is difficult in as many years of research. But the real challenge initially is to say, what's the question? So for us, we have to understand what is being controlled in this system. And for us, we frame this physically. And we say the real challenge that the, uh, the body is doing, it's preventing pathogens from getting into the cells and infecting the lung. So it's a race. The pathogens land on the mucus. There's a time for them to get through into the cells. There's a flow of the mucus to get the pathogens out. Who's going to win? 
the biophysical problem. So it's transport of this mucus, whether it's transport of the pathogens through or the flow of the mucus, both of those are what need to be controlled. Producing this mucus transport is propulsion, cilia and airflow. The particle transport through the mucus is controlled by the rheology, the viscoelasticity of the mucus. What's being sensed? Well, we think, we don't really know. Again, this is framing the question. We don't really know. We suspect that shear must be sensed. The flow must be sensed in some way. We think that one of the ways these sensors might work is by sensing biochemicals on the lung surface. What's the thermostat? In biology, the electronics in biology is biochemistry. And so there's a biochemical system that we have to understand. And finally, what's the furnace? What's actually changing the system? This again is biochemistry in producing proteins, long chain molecules that modify the rheology, water, which changes this liquid layer. So this is, in a sense, our hypothesis, the definition of the feedback loop. And our challenge now is to really understand the basic science behind this and put this in an integrated code. My particular research in this area involves three aspects. One is measuring the forces specifically that cilia generate in producing flow. One of the things is understanding the rheology of the mucus. If we're going to understand why mucus flow fails, we have to combine the forces that cilia push with the viscosity or the thickness of the mucus to understand why it gets too thick to prevent the cilia from pushing it. And finally, we come up with engineered mimics of this phenomena so we can do controlled study to validate the code. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use beads now instead of the AFM tip. We're going to put beads into our system. We're going to attach them to the ends of these cilia in order to grab a hold of the cilia. We're going to put the beads inside the mucus in order to measure the viscoelasticity of the mucus. Here's the instrument we've developed. If you've ever taken a nail and wrapped a wire around it and attached it to a battery and seen it pick up paper clips, that's essentially what we're doing. Our nail, though, is a thin foil, a thin sheet of foil. The wire isn't wrapped around the nail specifically, but it appears as these coils, these flat coils here. And they produce the magnetic flux that travels down the nail to the center region where our sample is. We flatten out the geometry of this so that we can do high resolution microscopy. And this has been the work of Jay Fisher uh, as a, a biomedical engineering graduate student. We've connected this up so you can hold on to this bead floating around in the microscope with the pen. As you move the pen now, you're moving the bead around, floating in three dimensions to interact with the specimen. Here's what it looks like. Here again are the, uh, these tips. And the sample is in the central region here where we can then measure the properties of the cilia. Here's what the experiment looks from the side. You have the bead attached here. You have this tip that comes in. And now it's going to apply forces on the, uh, the cilia. Unfortunately, this movie, of course, isn't playing. But this is what it looks like. And if the movie was playing, you'd see these beads going back and forth. And then when we turn on the magnetic field, the bead is pulled. The beading stops. And we stall the cilia. And we can measure that. So here's something of what we see. Here's the cilia beating. We apply a small force. We can see the whole cilia shift over. But this amplitude has decreased over the initial amplitude. When we apply a larger force, we can get the cilia to completely stop beating. So this starts quantifying the stall force. So what I'm plotting here, the student, for some reason, there's only so much you can tell students. At some point, they are just going to do what they want to do. So David Hill likes to draw graphs going up. All right? So let me try to explain this. This is the deduction or the reduction in the cilia beat versus the force. So zero means it has its full beat. 100% means it is stopped. That's the way he wants to plot the data. 
It's fine. As long as he takes the data, he can plot it any way he wants. So the star force here is somewhere around 600 to 700 piconews on the cilia. And there's details involved in this that I don't have time to discuss right now. Now, Jeremy has been working on using beads to measure rheology. <clears throat> so here's our, our sandwich again. Here's the metal tips. We're looking from the side now of the sample. The beads are put in here, and we pull on the beads. And the way the beads move tells us about the properties of the fluid in here, the polymeric fluid. And this is complemented with molecular dynamics stipulations by Michael Rubenstein. Here's two examples of fluids at the extreme. If you take water and you pull on a bead, you turn on the force for a time and then you turn it to zero, the bead moves uniformly. Stokes law. And when you stop the force, the bead just sits there. There's no force is applied on it. In a material which is elastic, you turn on the force, the bead displaces, and then it, it stays relatively still. You stretch the spring, you've stored energy in the material, you turn off the force, and the bead returns to its original location. That's an elastic material. Many materials are somewhere in between there. And so here's our example of DNA solutions, which we are using as model solutions to understand the polymer physics. And as we change the force that we're applying to the bead, we get different curve shapes. These reflect the elasticity and the viscosity. This is the part here where the bead is translating. And you can see it doesn't come back all the way. It's actually dissipated energy. We can now measure the rheological properties of the fluid. Fluids, in general, do something which is called shear thinning. And that is they get less viscous the more you rotate them. And we could see this effect happening with these small beads inside these small volumes. And so this is a way now for us to measure rheological properties of fluids, to feed into an integrated simulation, um, and to be able to do it in cell cultures and potentially inside animals. Our next step with this is actually to go to high throughput screening. And so to assign magnets now to each one of these wells to be able to do 100 experiments at once. Now, the people who are doing the computational modeling are uh, intellectually very honest as modeling people. And that is, they don't believe their set of equations until they are validated or tested um, experimentally. In other words, it's a little bit uh, disingenuous or false to come up with a model and then compare it with a biological situation. If you haven't independently tested the assumptions in your model. The complexity of the biology can be so, it can be so complex that it can mask the true phenomena that you're looking at. So we've been challenged to test the mathematical models in simpler settings. So there's two models. Soren Mitrin has a model of the beating cilium where he actually has a finite element model consisting of the molecular motors and the cilium and the, uh, the protein uh, beams inside the cilium. We have an analytical model for how a stiff rod rotates. So what we've done is we've taken, experimentally, we've taken these rods that are the diameter and the length of cilia. We put them into our magnetic system, and we can get this rod to spin inside a fluid. We take a particle inside the fluid, and we can track the motion of the particle inside the fluid. And in doing so, we can get the details of the fluid motion. Um, Terry Joe Leiterman here was the student who did the calculation. Rich McLaughlin here is for principles what the flow is. So here's Soren Mitrin's um, uh, simulation of a beating cilium. So this shows the finite element mesh. And what this mesh is actually also doing is keeping track of the fluid flow around the cilia. So these arrows here are actually calculating what the fluid flow is in a set of dynamical equations. And what we're challenged now to do is to develop a, bio, a, a biomimetic system to test this, which it may also have other applications. And we do this very simply. We fill the pores here with a uh, polymer solution that contains magnetic particles. 
We release it, and you can see these projections here, which are the size of cilia. When we apply a magnetic field, we can actually get these cilia to beat. Now, these are fake cilia. They're made of basically window caulking or silicone. Um, and now our challenge is to go ahead and compare these with the fluid flow they generate to um, compare with the simulations. And we can get these things to beat back and forth stiffly. We can get them to rotate. And we can control exactly how they beat by controlling the magnetic field. So let me basically end, I'm sorry this has gone over time, with kind of an overview of what the vision of this is. And basically, 10 years ago, the buzzword was genomics and understanding the gene, the DNA sequence. Eight years ago, five years ago, the question was proteomics. What are the proteins generated from these genes? More recently, attention has turned to a very awkward word called metabolomics, where you're looking at the biochemical networks that these proteins undergo to generate metabolism. In the end, what, we're, what we are returning to is pathology, in other words, disease. If any of you have sneezed, you know that forces are involved with uh, sneezing. And so what we're trying to do is introduce physics and predictive computation into medicine to generate a truly computational and predictive science from medicine. Let me just throw this in here. This is an advertisement for our workshop. Uh, for students being trained in the biophysical techniques I've described, and I'll be delighted to talk with people about this workshop in May at UNC. Um, and my acknowledgement slide has been dropped. I think I've acknowledged people as I've gone through the talk for the individual contributions. And I'd also like to thank our funding sources, which include uh, NSF and NIH. I'd like to thank you for your patience. Thank you.